You you pushed the button, didn't you? I I did. I pushed it. Is it red? Did you push a red button? Well, it's one of those like, do I push this button to? That was easy. To, to oh, I got one too. That um, Marcel, got what one we too. need to do? We we need to get like a Raspberry Pi red button and have it yeah. for Jason. Yeah, yeah. So this is. Yeah, you know, look, this changes my lights. If I press it, well, it used to, until it stopped working. <laughs> It's there. changing. Oh, it's blue, yeah. green. Is that party oh, music? Started playing. My music started playing too, so it's working. It's just not in the way I expected it. <laughs> now, now that I have to stop them. Okay, Ethan, so please explain the slides and the fact that you don't have a PDF. I do not have a PDF, and it's Jason's fault. <laughs> <laughs> No, because I'm I didn't make it. a template. I didn't make a template for Black Hill to use for. Where's my Uno reverse card meme? I need that right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I uh, I use something other than the normal slideshow tools, and yeah, the exporting to PDF was harder than I thought it was going to yes. be. It's, it's totally fine. Totally yeah. fine. It's okay, it actually makes it extra special. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like mean, you have a bunch of PowerPoint. So, so being true to form, I am using Docker to generate my slides, and nice. I, I do actually have a PDF export. It's just not; it doesn't look like what I'm going to show you guys. So, I'm I want it to be better. <laughs> so, you're using Docker you, to do your slides uh, to generate the PDF. So I'll use Docker. I I could use it for the actual presentation. But. And, and what is Docker and how do you use it? Uh, I, I wish I knew. <laughs> uh, Keith, Keith, could you do the presentation today? Ethan, we're going to do the... <laughs> Deep breaths. All right, everybody, welcome to today's Black Hills Information Security Disc uh, Discord. Information security webcast. We have Ethan Robish. He's giving our, his very first Black Hills webcast today, and it's going to be on what can Docker do for me. And so, if this is your first time, uh, we have a team of people on the back end. Our goal is to respond to all comments and questions with either we respond verbally through the webcast or we respond with a team of people on the back end answering those questions. We can't get to every one of them because sometimes we have thousands of people and they all ask questions, but we do do the best that we can. We will be sticking around for about 10 minutes after the webcast is over for what we call post-show banter, where we rapid fire answer questions. And then if you do have questions, we'll try to answer them during the webcast if it makes sense to do it at that time. And with that, Ethan, I'm gonna turn it over to you and it's all yours. All right, have we restarted recording? All right, cool. All right, so I am Ethan Robish. Thanks for the introduction, Jason. I have been a developer for probably 10 years, over 10 years now. Um, I've been a penetration tester with Black Hills for over eight years, and more recently, I've been a threat hunter. We talked about that in the pre-show banter. Keith, who's on here as well as a threat hunter. And anyway, I have used Docker in all these, all these roles, and it's been super helpful for me. So I have about three years, uh, maybe a little more of like good solid Docker experience, just using it in these roles. So that's that's a little bit about me. Let's talk about like what what we're gonna talk about in this in this presentation. So some of my goals for this presentation are to introduce you to Docker, to have maybe tell you how it can improve your workflow, and I want to mention that this this goal of the presentation is, or the topics of, in this presentation are mainly for development or QA or penetration testing or maybe a lab environment. So some of the things I'm not going to be covering are the, I'm not going to try to convince you to go to your boss or manager and convert all your company's services to running in Docker or in containers. That's That's not the goal here. Uh, so likewise, I'm not going to be doing an in-depth security discussion about Docker. So this is you—you you will be able to use Docker 
in your role as a security analyst, for instance. But this is not, hey, what are the security impl- implementations or security ramifications if we end up deploying a service available to our customers in Docker? And then the other thing this is not going to cover is any sort of container orchestration. So this is a very intro to how to use Docker. So we're not even going to get into Docker Compose, which is actually very useful just in your day-to-day role. But uh, some of the things you might have heard of are Docker Swarm or Kubernetes. We're not, gonna, we're not going to discuss those in the presentation. However, if you have questions and we have time, feel free to, to post those. So really, this presentation came about because I heard a bunch of people say, oh yeah, Docker, I, I should use Docker, but I, I haven't, I ha- or I haven't looked at it, or maybe they tried Docker and hit some roadblock and just you know, gave up or haven't realized like why, you know, what, what can this do for me? Like, well, why is this useful? So really I'm gonna be most, the meat of this presentation is going through a whole bunch of use cases where maybe you can see fitting fitting one of these use cases into your workflow and it helping out. All right. So reasons to use Docker. They're better than VMs, but better should be in air quotes or <laughs> asterisks. So the better that I'm talking about, uh, they're smaller than VMs, they're lighter weight, they start up faster, and they're they're more, I guess, ephemeral, so temporary. You can spin them up, and tear them down really easy, and that's what they're meant for. They are lighter on resource usage because they're not trying to trying to emulate a whole operating system under the hood. They're they're sharing. So Docker containers share a lot of the resources with your host machine, rather than isolating everything in a VM. So I guess that is one security aspect. Um, if you're worried, VMs provide better isolation. But that's that's kind of the pros and cons. So Docker plays well with others. So what I mean by that is if you have different tools installed on your system and you try to install another tool that maybe uses some of the same libraries or uh, different versions of those libraries, you could run into trouble where you you have conflicts and you have, you're stuck troubleshooting and trying to trying to resolve those conflicts. Well. With Docker, everything is packaged into its own container, and you can have whatever versions of different dependencies living in those containers, and they don't they don't conflict with each other that way. And likewise, if you ever have struggled to install a tool on Linux or try to compile it from scratch to, from source code, you'll be intimately familiar with all the dependencies that you have to install. And sometimes those dependencies can be hard to install. So anyway, with Docker, a lot of time you don't even have to deal with that because someone else has already made a Docker file for you or or an image that you can use. But even if you end up making your own, Docker makes it really easy to just do it once and then you don't ever have to worry about it again because you have easy reproducibility with, with your Docker files. Okay, so let's get to how do we install Docker? This is actually more confusing than I think it needs to be. But if you're on Windows or Mac, you want Docker Desktop. So if we go to Docker's website, you can see Docker Desktop. And it gives you options. So Mac, Windows, you, you download that. It's, it's an installer. Or on, on Mac, it's just an app. Actually, I think it is an installer on Mac, too. But anyway. With with that, you get a bunch of cool stuff already baked in. You get Docker, you get you get Docker Compose, and they even throw in a Kubernetes cluster if you want to enable that. So that's that's pretty cool. There is there are some caveats. So Docker is native to Linux. That's where it was built for, and getting it to run on Windows and Mac is uh, Docker has had to do some like workarounds where they have like a lightweight virtual machine running or it's gotten a lot better. So like I'm I'm running Windows now. Thank thank you, go to webinar. <laughs> so what I had to do to get Docker installed was just download Docker desktop and and run the installer, but then I enabled Windows subsystem for Linux 2, which is fairly new, I think within the last few months. 
and Docker has a lot better integration with Windows through that. Okay, so what if you're on Linux? Well, <laughs> if we if we go back to Docker Desktop, you can see oh, there's a there's a Linux option here, and that takes you to a page where you select your operating system or you, you select your distribution. So we'll try that. Oh, it doesn't even give you a download on here. It it links you to docu their documentation. So that's that's what I've got here. It's just links to the documentation. So it, whether you are on CentOS, Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu, or even others, so Docker under the hood is just a, a, a binary written in Go. And so it's likely you can run it on basically any Linux distribution. Yeah, OK, so on Linux, <laughs> some other caveats. You're, if you're running Linux and you search your, your distribution's uh, normal package repository, you might find a Docker package. But chances are you don't want to use that Docker package. So first of all, it'll probably be called something different. It might just be called Docker or Docker Engine or Docker.io. These are all legacy names that aren't used anymore. And this is actually the instructions tell you uninstall old versions first. So these are all the things that it might have been called before in Fedora. So the, the new package from each in each distribution is called docker-ce, which stands for Community Edition, because Docker also has enterprise support available. Hey, Ethan. Yeah. Can you drop the links to these into the good webinar chat so we can drop them and everyone can follow along at home if they want to? Sure. There's Thanks. one. Awesome. So everyone uh, just take a look in the good webinar chat and you'll be able to follow along if you'd like to with what Ethan's looking at. Okay. All right. So that's instructions for each distribution. If you're wanting to get the, the supported method to install Docker and that, that's that definitely the recommended way if you're doing anything in production. But for us, if we're doing all this all in a lab environment or just on your desktop, there's an easy way. So Docker has a shell script, and this is for Linux only. But if we go to that, you can see it's just, just a plain text shell script. And they, they give you instructions on how to run it, too. So if you, if you just run this, Docker will automatically detect your distribution and install itself. But it makes a lot of assumptions that you might not want if you're doing it on production. OK, so once we've got Docker installed, how do we use it? What does it do? This is kind of a, a diagram I put together of just kind of the basics that we need to, to get started. So there's this concept kind of all revolves around an image, so a Docker image. And we'll cover what that is in a, in a second more in depth. So from an image, you can create a container. And that's where you actually can interact and have, have a service that's running. And then to get an image in the first place, you can access a Docker registry. Where you where people have stored pre-created images or pre-made images, you can you can push your own there, or you can pull someone else's, and you can get an image that way. Or if you have a Docker file, either yours or someone else's, which I'll show you a Docker file in a minute too, but it's just a plain text set of instructions. You can build a, an image from the Docker file. Okay, so an image. If if you want to think about what an image is. Coming from maybe a sysadmin role where you have a lab where, or a, a, an environment where you need to um, deploy a stat or like a single image to a whole bunch of computers, you're going to have a golden image that you maybe use to DD or fog or uh, I don't know what the, the <laughs> enterprise versions are, but you'll use something like that to to get all the to get your golden image onto the on the systems in a vm world you can think of it as a snapshot so you can always restore to a snapshot and get back you know the, the state that you started with so that's that's kind of what an image is it's a packaged version of uh, a disk all right so a docker file that i mentioned earlier so we can use a docker file to create an image and this is a pretty simple Docker file. So it starts out, you always declare what, what you're coming from, so what image you're basing this on. And that might, 
you might think like, okay, it's, <laughs> it, so there's got to be a beginning one. So there is actually one called From Scratch, which has basically nothing in it. But as we'll see in a minute, there are a whole bunch of Docker images available for you to build upon if you're making your own Docker file available on Docker Hub. And then after that, you might want to do a bunch of commands. In this case, we're doing run. So you just notice like this is a normal bash command that you might run uh, on, on a Debian system. And that's, that's really all it is. So you say run, and I want to run this command. So we're outputting hello world to a text file. And so when that final image gets compiled or built, it's going to have a text file in it with the contents of hello world. And if I distributed that to everyone, everyone, everyone would have that same image, that same message. And then when you run a Docker file, but you start it up in a container, or sorry, in a Docker image, there are a couple ways to tell it what to do when it starts. So entry point is one of them. And all we're doing is just catting out that message. So printing out the, the message that we stored earlier. So that's a very simple Docker file, what, what that looks like. So I talked about registries earlier, and that they, it's a server that stores pre-built images. You can think of it like a, like a Linux package repository. So like you might use apt or yum to grab packages. Just, I'll, I'll show you a minute what I mean, but it, there are a ton of uh, applications or even operating systems that you can grab from places like Docker Hub. So if we go to explore, we can see there's 3.6 million available images. So quite, quite a lot. But we can, we can sort or filter on the side here. There's all sorts of different categories that you can choose. Let's choose operating systems. And we've got Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, Fedora. So all the ones that you might be familiar with, and then maybe some that you're not, that can be used as, as a base image to build your application on. Quay is another one. So during this pre-show banter, someone was mentioning Red Hat. And Quay is uh, Red Hat's version of Docker Hub. It's a, it's a container registry. And you can actually use other tools, too, to build containers or uh, yeah, container images, which I've been calling Docker images. But Docker is really just a front end to these open source specifications. So the same concepts will apply to tools like Podman or Rocket. But we're going to be mainly talking about Docker Hub and Docker. All right, so container. If we go back to our VM analogy or our provisioned server uh, where you, ha you have an environment and you send out a golden image. So once you have a server provisioned with that golden image, that, that's like a container. And once you start that up, it's going to start and have everything that golden image has on it. But as that server runs and as it gets interacted with by you know, it, it, its users or remote customers, it's going to change and it'll get new stuff on it. Hey, hey Ethan, a yeah. uh, quick question that keeps coming up is uh, how do you know you can trust those Docker images? Oh, that's a good question. So if we go back to the Docker file, if you read it, this is basically like reading the source for a, an image. So if you look at the Docker file that generated a, a Docker image, you can see exactly what went into it, what, what, what's in it. There are, there are cases, and I don't know if I'll be able to find one, but let's, let's go here. So if you go to Ubuntu, and where is, actually, this is a case. <laughs> so I, I would say, in general, anything that's Docker official images, I would trust. Most of the time, they're gonna, there's going to be another section over here that'll say uh, like links to the Docker file that generated it or the GitHub repository that it's linked to. Because with Docker Hub, you can just link it to a GitHub repository and tell it, hey, here's, here's a Docker file in there. And any time that GitHub repository changes, it will automatically update the image based on that Docker file. So if, if it has a Docker file here, you can go and read what's, what's all in it. But if you're searching for something, what's what's one I was looking for earlier?
yeah, so so this one has source repository, and you can go there and look at the look at the source code for the Docker image. And oh, there was a it actually copies the Docker file here, so you can read it there. But anyway, the w one thing I wanted to point out that's important is if you look at some of these other ones, like this one, there's there's not a Docker file there. So what what people can actually do is if you have a Docker Hub account, you can make an image on your local system, and you can just push that image up to Docker Hub, and then you don't you don't really know what's in it. So there are tools, as I mentioned earlier, the excuse me, the image Docker images are based on an open specification. I think uh, OCI comes to mind. Open Container Initiative has the the spec. And there are tools to be able to inspect and look into a Docker image. And I think I think you might even be able to use tar to extract it. But then once once you're in there, you've got to deal with all the layers and stuff. So then it, it feels more like forensics at that point or reverse engineering. So if, if there's a Docker file available, that's the, definitely the easiest way to go verify. OK, so back to our, our diagram here. So a Docker file makes an image, image. You, you can start up multiple containers from an image. With an image, you can get it from a, a registry or, or the Docker file. And so then the, the lines here are the commands that we would use when running Docker, or Podman for that matter. So Docker, if you take a Docker file and you build it, you, so, so you say Docker build, you'll get an image. If, and then you can say Docker push, and that'll push it to a registry. Or you can say Docker pull, and that'll get it from registry. You can run a container, or you can create a container. So the difference here, so if you take an image and create a container, it's like provisioning a server that's turned off. So, so you have a container there, but it's not doing anything. It's turned off. The process is not running. If you do run, it will create the container still for you, but it will also start it up automatically. And it will run the command that's configured in the, in the Docker file or in the image. So in this case, in my simple example here, it's entry point. And this, was, this is the command, or entry point signifies the command that should be run when it starts up. In this case, it will just print out a message and call it good. Any other questions at this point? Uh, no, I keep have going. a fair share of questions. Yes. Okay. All right, go for, go for it, CJ. Oh, boy. Picking them out now is hard because I got so many. People are asking where you were doing that. So the curl, can you repost the curl? Also, they want you to increase the, the font size when you're in a terminal window. Uh, I haven't actually been in a terminal window yet, but that's what I thought. When, <laughs> when you're looking at the web pages, just increase the size, the control got plus it. or the thing. Sure. OK. Um, One more. Yeah. <laughs> When they're running Docker and they build an image, they find that they forget things. Is there any sort of checklist or things you can use? Are there any shortcuts, tools? I mean, it sounds to me like you said, go find a Docker image that already does what you, you want. Go for yeah, that. I'm not sure what they mean by forget things. Because if you build an image, it's either going to error or it's going to succeed. And you if forget you... to install software, Vim, Nano, Netcat. OK. Let's let, let's cover it. Can, can you remind me to come back to that one at the end? Yes, sir. OK, so I feel like we could dig quite deep into that one. OK, okay. I should discuss this slide first. So different use cases that I'm going to demo are like just pulling down a Linux distribution of your choice. So we already saw some of that earlier on Docker Hub, just all the choices available. We can look at different databases. So these are just examples. Obviously, the use cases for Docker are almost endless, but a common thing that you might want to do is like have a database set up and normally it takes quite a bit of setup to to you know install a database configure it get get the all the tables that you need the database set up and the the user accounts created and docker can help with that and then if you're just running tools so like database clients or penetration testing tools those those also are great use cases for docker OK, so I guess the first thing, if you're coming from security, that you might be curious about, does Kali run in Docker? Yes. Yes, it does. So I'll throw that in chat. It's literally all we need to do to start, start up Kali. So the command docker container run, 
And then we've got the image over here. So there's a couple flags. So if, we're, if we go back to our Dockerfile example and we think about the entry point into that, that image that we're starting, starting up in a container, a lot, of, a lot of time for these distros, that entry point is just going to be bash. So it's going to drop you into a shell. But when, when you do Docker run, it's basically just tailing the output of the command for you. And it doesn't give you interactive capabilities with it. So that's why you'll see this a lot if you're dealing with any sort of program that you're going to want to interact with. So there's an interactive flag and a TTY flag. And those are all shortened. So Docker. Let's, let's go look at an example, actually. I think I'm going to make this bigger. All right, so Docker has a bunch of subcommands. Builder, config, container. Container is what we just saw. The main ones that we want to pay attention to, container, image, and let's Probably it for now. There's also network, which is important. So th these are under each of these, the so Docker container. There's more commands. So Docker container run is what we did before. But there's Docker also gives you a shortcut, so you don't have to type it out every time. So Docker container run. If you just do Docker run, it's the same thing. So run a command in a new container. So there's a lot of commands at the top level that are just kind of assumed to, um, they're, they're shortcuts for common things that you're going to want to do. So docker run dash it, this is the, the common thing that you'll see all over the place. So let's, let's copy that in and see what happens. Oh, that was really fast. We're at a prompt already. Okay, so uh, one, one thing to know about Docker distros, to keep the size down of the image, most of the time it won't have any sort of cached repositories or really any, any cache at all. So like for, for any tool that you might, that might normally use a cache. So the first thing we're going to want to do if we want to install anything is just apt update. And we can see we are indeed in Kali. And remember I said I'm running on Windows. So I just started a Docker container in Windows. But now I'm in a Kali prompt. All right, so what's, what's the tool we might want? And map. So you can use Docker as just running one-off things, or you can use it interactively, just, just like I'm doing here. So let's say we want to do nmap of Black Hills. And you can run tools just, just like you would normally. All right, finally it returned. And we just see we have web servers open. All right, so let's think about the alternatives if we're not using Docker. If we just wanted to install Kali for, to, to run a simple tool like Nmap, we can go to Kali's website and download the full ISO. That's an option, but that's 2.9 gigabytes in size. Wow, that's a lot for just running Nmap. I mean, of course, you can install Nmap just on your own operating system directly. But if we think about any arcane tool that you might choose Kali for rather than trying to get it installed yourself. Another option on Kali's website, OK, so we say we don't need a full desktop environment. We don't need a GUI. Uh, we don't need all the tools pre-installed. That's still 420 megabytes. But if we do the Docker image, it's 100 and 113. So, so that's like a almost a third of the size or a fourth of the size. And the cool thing is if you push images up to Docker Hub, it will compress it for you. So actually what you're downloading over your, ben over your link is all, like, just shy of 50 megabytes. So that's really fast. And then you saw the startup time. It was it was super easy, super quick between the Docker run command and getting to a, a shell. All right, so we already saw earlier, uh, we have Debian available, Ubuntu, CentOS, Fedora. Those are just the major ones that people have probably heard of. So there's also Windows. 
Oh, well, that's weird. What? I thought this was a Linux thing. So it, Microsoft has a bunch of images on Docker Hub. Which is kind can of crazy the, when you think about can, it. Can you drop that link inside the Good Webinar? Yeah. And then another quick question is, um, can you assign or limit the resources which Docker is using, like CPU, RAM, et cetera? Yes, you can. I won't cover that in the in, in this talk, but you can give it memory and CPU uh, constraints. And even they're asking you to drop any commands you type into Discord as well, if you could. <laughs> let's, let's, I'll, I'll try to share them later. There's going to be a lot of commands. Okay, so let's let's continue on this. So this is Microsoft Windows Server Core. There's also a nano server that's available, which are just small Docker images for Microsoft Windows. So before you get too excited, like I was when I first saw this, <laughs> you can't actually run these from a Linux host, which is sad. You, uh, all right, so how to use this image? Windows requires the host OS version to match the container OS version. So if you want to run a Windows container, you have to be on a Windows host. And there's actually some even stricter requirements about matching the version. I don't think you have to be quite exact as it, that sentence says, but alternatively, you can use Hyper-V as a backend for Docker, which essentially you're running a container inside of a VM at that point. So you, you get a lot more flexibility, but you're also negating a lot of the benefits of Docker. However, it might be worth it to get Docker inside or Windows inside of Docker. So just know that these are available if you do have a need for a Windows Docker container. Let's discuss tags quick. So Microsoft has a bunch of different tags, which are different versions. So each, each one of these tags is going to be a different image that's pushed up to Docker. So the latest service pack or whatever the feature pack that they're calling it now is, is given a tag on here. And you can get older ones as well. So if you don't specify a tag, so if you notice when we did Kali, I didn't specify a tag. The way you normally do a tag is with a colon after the image name, and then you give it the tag name, but I don't have that on here. So if you just do the image name, it, it auto assumes colon latest. So latest is like a special tag where if you don't put it, that's, that's what it's going to use, which could be a gotcha on Windows because note, this repo does not publish or maintain a latest tag. So already they're breaking conventions, but they do give you all the specific tags that you can use here. So if you, if you try to use this and do a Docker pull, you do have to give it a tag. Anyway, I'm not going to spend too much time on Windows because we're talking about Docker and Linux. So here's, here's a, a, some examples of tags that you could use. So if you need like a really old version of Debian or Ubuntu, those tags are available. So you can just go and uh, get the latest version, or you can go run an old version. Say if you're trying to install a tool that you know hasn't been updated in years and is geared towards a specific version of a distro. So that that kind of goes towards the point of getting out of de dependency hell. <laughs> All right, so next section. Before I move on, are there any other questions at this point? I have one. This yeah. one keeps coming up. So how can Docker be so small in size compared to everything else? There must be compromises with the smaller size. So everyone, yeah. there, there's a consensus of like, well, if it's smaller, then there, it must not be all, everything. Yeah. So I wonder if they still have it up. So Docker containers do not have an init D daemon. They, so this gets into pretty much the edge of my knowledge for like Linux, Linux, uh, like deep, deep dive into Linux, I guess. So, but when you when you start a Linux system, the process, the PID one, is supposed to be the init daemon, and Docker doesn't have. And usually, that's something like systemd or initd. 
but Docker doesn't have systemd. So the PID one is whatever we're using for our entry point in our Docker file. That's that's what's going to get run. So that that's one of the things that's cut out. So I'm going to cover this a, a little bit more later. But Docker is meant to really run one one process, and like each each container should be running one process. There there are way around, ways around that. But then you start fighting against like what Docker is meant to do, and it can be useful and rewarding in the end to to like put multiple things in and install your own supervisor or init process in there. But just know that you're you're in for an uphill battle. However, if you use someone else's image that has already done that, it it is it can be quite nice. Uh, so trying to see what else has been cut out. So the Debian one, the Debian image in Docker, Docker Hub, oh, oh, put that link in, talks more about like how it's made. And I think it, they might talk about what, some of the stuff that they include and exclude. And then a lot of times there are variants of images. So you can have Debian latest or Debian 6, like my example earlier, or you can say Debian 6 dash slim. And this is even even smaller. So they cut out more things like man pages, documentation that you probably aren't going to need in a in a container. So yes, there are trade-offs. And I'm not sure of the full list, but I gave you what I knew. <laughs> Any other questions at this point? I'm not uh, quite as fast as you. <laughs> Does the container then have access to the file system of the host? So by default, it does not. And that, that can be, that, I mean, that's a good thing for separation, but it's a, a bad thing for <laughs> if you're just starting out, like, how do I use this thing and how do I, how do I get access to my files? And I'll, I'll cover that in a little bit. Actually, I think I missed a slide, but it, it's, it's called volumes. And you have to specify volumes and say very precisely like what you want shared with the container from the host. You specify it so it's off by default. Yep. So I don't know if I understand. Are containers sandboxed from the host OS? I think that's what you're saying. Yes, is because you start at that init point. That's where yeah, the process starts. Sandbox is kind of a fuzzy term. Okay. So I mean, I could say yes, they are sandboxed, but there there's different levels, right? So you can have and and there's tons of different types of sandboxes. But if we think about virtual machines, that's that. That could also be called the sandbox, and that's uh, containers are not as sandboxed or as isolated as a virtual machine would be. So under the hood, Docker containers are implemented with Linux C groups and namespaces. So C groups is for the the resource constraints that someone else asked earlier, like limiting memory usage, limiting CPU, and the namespaces are what does the the sandboxing i guess in in linux so if you're running something inside of a namespace you need to have extra permissions in order to break out of that namespace or chill yeah i got a bunch okay so this is actually one that i thought i was interesting i don't know can you establish a oh no not that one but will applications in Windows Docker have access to GPUs? So can you like pass through GPUs? So is that Windows specifically or just in general? I think, that, well, I'm not sure if it was specified, but the question was, will applications in, the, in a Windows Docker container have access to the GPUs of the host? I think that's what the person meant. OK, so win Windows, I'm not sure about, because there might be, there's always caveats when you're switching from Docker on Linux to Windows. But with Docker, by default, in a container, the, the container does not have access to any system devices, which, which is what a GPU would be. But you can share those so that there's command line options for making certain devices accessible in, inside a container. So there are actually, I don't know if I'll be able to get this on the first try, but there should be containers. Yeah, so NVIDIA. This, this is a container made by NVIDIA about doing GPU development inside a container. So I'm sure they have instructions here. OK, maybe not, but it should somewhere. There should be a link to some documentation about it, how to, how to actually run and use it. 
Dope. And um, yeah, one more. Yeah, has anyone built an entire cyber range with Docker images and Docker networking? Probably yes. I would, I, I, I would say almost certainly yes. I, I've seen lab environments and like challenge environments that are done inside of Docker. Yeah. Yep. Alrighty, I got a bunch more, but I'll wait for you to continue, and then we'll get to those afterwards. Cool. Okay, so the next example of use cases that I wanted to cover are databases. And again, this this can be this can be really any service that you can think of that would normally be on a server. So a web server like Nginx, a message queue like RabbitMQ, caching server like Redis, just you name it. But I'm using databases to just kind of showcase what this is capable of. So if we talk about Postgres to start with, this is so I just give the commands of how to run it. And let's all right, let's break down the command first. So Docker container run, that's familiar. We already did that. Uh, the rest of this is new. So Postgres is the image name. So we're just saying, hey, we want we want Postgres. So what are some of these flags? So I, I mentioned namespaces earlier, and that's the segregation or the sandboxing that Docker does. So by default, it's going to be in a separate network namespace. So in, if you're inside a container, you're not going to be you're not going to have the same network interface interfaces that your host does. And so likewise, if you're trying to access a service that's running inside of Docker, you're, you're not going to be able to because it's listening on an interface that's inside of the container. So it's in a separate namespace and it's not accessible to packets coming in on your host unless you specifically make it accessible. So that's what this is doing. So this is saying publish port and this is the default Postgres port. Uh, so this is the host side. We're going to publish this port on the host to, it's basically mapping the host port to the container port. So if you notice, you have to specify both of them, which is kind of nice because you can make the host port anything, and you could just leave the, so from the from Postgres's standpoint, it's listening on its normal port. But you can access it from, say, port 80 if you really wanted to host from a different system or from the host, I guess. So the detach flag, so when I ran the Kali the Docker command, notice we dropped into bash right away, and then it showed output on my screen. So the detach is going to run the container and just go into the background. It's going to give you your host prompt back right away. So your container will keep running in the background, but it's not going to show you the output. And then here we're setting a couple environment variables. So these aren't, this is just a generic, like, hey, set, set an environment variable in a container. And then whatever variable that you give is specific to each container. So this is one of the cool things I wanted to show you. So not you don't have or image maintainers don't have to do this, but a lot of them do. And that's another cool thing about Docker that that makes it easier to use is image can, image maintainers will go quite a bit out of their way to make it super easy for you to run whatever program it is that's in their image. So. In this case, if we think about installing Postgres from without Docker, so you, you do like apt install Postgres, maybe you have to like add the package repository first to get like an updated version. You uh, so depending on your operating system, after you install it with your package manager, maybe the daemon is running and listening, or maybe not. And then you're definitely not going to have automatically created users and unless you do like some extra setup scripts. So what they've done specifically for Postgres here is they present these, uh, they make these environment variables available for you. So Postgres user is one, Postgres password, you can specify the database name, and then there's a few others, but these are the, these are the two that we're going to concentrate on. So if we run this right away. And this this is just the shortened version down here. So let's let's go ahead and run it. And I think there was a request to paste in commands, so I'll do that. Oh yeah, so that it's it's done. Like remember I said it's going to detach, so it prints out this hex string, and then it just came back to my prompt. So if we want to see that it's running, we do Docker PS and see. All right, yep, I've got. My window isn't wide enough, so it's wrapping. But we've got container ID here, which should correspond to just a shortened version of this string. Yep. We got the image. We know we're running Postgres. This tells us the command that was run. 
or the entry point of that container, when it was created, how long it's been up, and then here's the port mapping. So we're mapping, we're listening on all interfaces on the host and mapping our Postgres port. And then Docker will automatically assign it a random name. I guess it's not completely random, but an arbitrary name, I'll say. And that's, you, you can use that in store or the container ID to, to reference it. But you can also assign a custom name, which is handy if you want to have a long running service and interact with it a bunch. All right, so we've got Postgres running in the background. Now what? Let's let's look at a client. So what what are we doing here? So Docker run dash it, which we've seen before. Let's make it interactive so we can actually type and get output. So it's dash rm dash dash rm. We haven't seen that before, but that's short for just remove the container when it exits. So by default, when a container exits, it's going to remain around. It's like a system that's still there, but it's powered off, right? So if we do Docker PS like we did before, we can see the ones that are running. If we do Docker PS dash A, we can see, oh, there's a couple more. Well, that's because I ran some Docker containers and they're not running anymore. So we can see, uh, let's see, that's this last one maybe. Yeah, Postgres was run five hours ago, but it exited four hours ago. So it's, it's still hanging around and I could do Docker start on this container and it would start up again, but we're not gonna do that right now. All right, so Docker run Postgres, we're gonna use the Postgres image again. And then we haven't seen the rest of this. So if you specify arguments afterwards, basically that tells, that replaces the command that is in the Docker file. So instead of running Postgres, Postgres's daemon, and starting up a Postgres server, we're telling it to run Postgres client psql. And then the rest of these are just arguments to psql. So we're telling it to uh, use, use this IP address and then use the username of Docker. So let's, let's double check that IP address, see if it runs, and then OK, so it's asking for a password, which we know because we set that up above. So when we ran our Postgres daemon, we set these environment variables. We gave the username of Docker, and we have our super awesome, super secret awesome password. All right, cool. We're, we're in. So you can see you can just interact with the, the database that way. And that's not all that interesting to look at. So let's go to the next next example for a client. So this is actually a web client. And interesting story, I was on a, a penetration test and I found a, a Redis server just running. It, and I wanted to, and it said it was running with no authentication. So I'm like, okay, well I wanna I want to be able to connect to this Redis server. So I actually used Docker, I installed Docker, and I went to a Docker Hub, and I, I think I searched for Redis. Actually, I might, have, I might have searched Google to find a client first, and then I used the client name. But I think I ended up using Redis Commander here. So Redis Web Management Tool written in Node.js. So I don't know if you've ever installed Node.js packages, but versioning is definitely an issue with Node.js. You, you have to get the right version of Node.js. You have to get the right version of all the packages, which hopefully they've provided you with a, a package lock file. But if not, then good luck. So, and also it, don't install things globally if you need more than one. Yeah, anyway, th this gets into the dependency issues. So with Docker, it's really easy. You just run this command, run, you know, Docker run and Redis commander, tell it the image. And then just like that, I had a Redis client that I could point to that Redis server that I had found and I was interacting with it. So let's do the same thing, but for Postgres. So again, here, these are some default environment variables that the image makes available for you. And this just creates a user so that I can log in. And I'm mapping port 8080 to port 80 inside the container. So this, whenever you go to Docker Hub, they'll usually have an example command of how to get started. And let's see. Yeah, I did the Docker server, so here's the Docker client. Let's go run this. All right. 
So th I didn't pull this locally before, so it's not using my local cache. It's pulling it down live from Docker Hub, so it might take a while. So actually, if there are any questions at this point, it would be a good time. Sorry to spring it on you guys. <laughs> It takes a minute to click everything. Yeah. yeah, so for everyone asking about the slides today, we're going to have slides in the near future. We have to figure out a way to export them from this awesome thing that uh, Ethan's using called reveal.js. So for everyone that's asking about, what's he using for his presentation? Reveal.js. So go ahead, TJ. So somebody Google that and tell us how to export into PDF. Come on. I I got it to export to PDF. It just doesn't look very good, so I'm gonna fix it before we. Wow, oh, perfectionist! How are users inside and outside of Docker's being managed? Uh, users, sure okay. that, which I think the answer to that is no. But <laughs> sorry, how are they being managed? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So by default, your user inside your container is root. So UID one or zero? I can't remember, but. Yeah. You can you can create users in inside your Docker image, uh, like as part of your Docker file. You can say, "Hey, add user," and give it a different ID, and then you can you can run your service using a different user. But by default, everything is run with root inside the, the container, which is different from root outside the container. It does give you extra privileges inside the container. So, like one of the dangers, I believe, is if you're running root inside a container and you like someone compromises that container. And there's a kernel exploit. So remember, Docker is not a virtual machine. It shares a lot of stuff with the host. So it shares the same kernel. So if there's a kernel exploit in, and you can run it inside the container as a root, you will break out of the Docker container and get access to the host. But if, say, your kernel exploit requires root access first or something, which eh, that doesn't really make sense. <laughs> I was trying to think of a good other example. Anyway, it, if you reduce it, it's good practice to reduce the permissions inside the Docker container, but in practice, not too many images go that extra effort to, to do that. Go ahead, Marcello. OK, so there was a question here, which was, how do you tell the difference between Docker clients from real hosts on a network? So if you're scanning a network, how would you differentiate like Docker clients for Docker applications from like applications running on the actual host, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, from a from a network standpoint, I'm not sure. I I, I don't know if you can. Yeah, I don't. Um, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so either, it, to be honest. It, yeah, it, I guess like it would be possible if you did, got like really good with OS fingerprinting, because if you think about your host, is going to be running probably some Linux distribution, say Red Hat, but your Docker image could be running a different Linux distribution. And if there's some way to fingerprint both, like you'd you'd see some ports would show up as like Red Hat, but then some would show up as you know say Debian or something inside the Docker container. Uh, that that'd be really tricky. Yeah. But if you're if you're on, inside a container, say you, you compromise an application, there are ways. Uh, I just don't remember any of that off the top of my head. A lot of the time, actually, I could think of a couple. So if you do ENV, a lot of time you'll see environment variables set and it'll be pretty obvious that like these were started because of docker you could look at the pid so if the pid one is or sorry you do, do a process list and if pid one is not like an init process that might be a good indication and i think there's some there's some files on the disk too that can give it away but i can't remember off the top of my head yeah yeah, I think uh, like from a network standpoint, though, there aren't a lot of them. Like the only thing I can think of is maybe like if if you can get access to like a, like a dashboard of the app and you see like there's it's obviously running in a Docker container, but other than that, right? Yeah. And the other question was: Does endpoint security see inside containers? That's a good question. Does endpoint security see inside containers? So like, if you're, you know, Joe Smith is running Docker on his desktop. Is your endpoint product going to see that he's using wget to get ransomware <laughs> inside From a container? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I would be surprised. I'm, I'm sure there are some, and they're probably very prominent using that in their marketing because I don't think there's a ton of them out there that do that. 
Docker is something you would restrict from your average user, right? Yeah, you'd, you'd think uh, so. Yeah, I mean, I guess from a window, like if you're running Windows and you install Docker and there's an EDR, I guess if the EDR hooks like kernel Windows functions, then it might be able to see because it's they're sharing the same kernel, right? But that heavily depends yeah. on the with Docker. Windows, it gets even more complex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it yeah. depends on the Docker backend. I think it really does depend on like if you're using Hyper-V or if you're using yeah. like the normal Docker yeah. backend. I, I suppose it's the same, almost the same answer as like, hey, does your EDR detect what your user is doing in a VM? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much yeah. Okay. How so, is, oh, sorry. Oh no, I was going to ask you a question, but go ahead. Go okay. right ahead. Yeah. So, so our our dashboard is up. So this is just program called PG Admin, which is a web interface for administering a Postgres database. So if we go back to environment variables we passed, so we saw our default email, I did my email, and then I did a create password. So let's log in. All right, so right now we're connected to the dashboard, but we haven't connected to the Postgres server. So how do we do that? Well, with this particular tool, you just add in a server, a new server, and now we have to tell it where it's at. So this is where it gets tricky thinking in containers because each container has a different network namespace. So we'd have to, in order to kind of communicate directly with the container, we'd have to like create another network and put both containers on the network. But because earlier we mapped the we mapped that port to the host we're going to use the host ip address so this is the ip address of my docker host and i mapped it to that port and let's see we use docker and the super secret awesome password hopefully i type that right all right and we're connected so we can log in and you can see all the databases that are there and just interact. I mean, this isn't all that interesting because it's a new database with no data in it, but it's kind of cool how easy it is to get a, a client for whatever service that you're trying to interact with. Like say, say you find some arcane service that you haven't heard of. Maybe you never heard of Redis or RabbitMQ or whatever. Well, do a bit of Googling and you're like, okay, RabbitMQ client and like, oh, it's some Ruby program that someone writ wrote, but I don't want to have to install Ruby, install RVM to get the right version of Ruby, install all the dependencies on my system when, you know, it, it just, it's difficult. So maybe your first go-to is just searching like, hey, RabbitMQ name of client or whatever you found, and then find a Docker image, and then you just run it. So that's, that's exactly what I did for, for Redis. And that's what I just showed you for Postgres, how you can do that too. All right, so another really cool thing you can do. So I mentioned earlier that we're mapping or publishing ports. So this is the port on the inside of the container for po that Postgres is listening on. And these will be documented, or they should be documented, by the image maintainer. You can, you can look at the image or the Docker file itself to find these, but a good assumption is just, you know, if it's a common service like Postgres, okay, what's the default port that it listens on? That's usually the one that they're going to be listening on. But I mentioned you don't have to map it to the same port on the host. So here we could, we could run, I'm currently running a Postgres database already, but I could run three more versions in parallel, all with very, very specific version numbers or very different version numbers and all on different ports. And I could just do that with these these Docker run commands. So I, I don't know how difficult that would be to do without Docker, but I suspect it wouldn't be super easy if you're like a sysadmin trying to run, you know, multiple services, but it's the same service, just different versions on the same system. That just that doesn't sound like a fun day. All right. Uh, we have, we two only minute have left. Yep, two minute warning, Ethan. <laughs> okay. I'm going to skip eyewitness. This is just showing that, that you can find a bunch of eyewitness images on Docker Hub. And you can use Docker search 
to interface with Docker Hub. You don't have to use the web interface like I've been doing. But another way to find here, go back. Another way to find a Docker image for your favorite tool is if you go to their GitHub repo or you know wherever their source code is and look in the root for a Docker file. That's usually where it is. Or in this case, you can search their install documentation or their just their readme and find, oh yes, there is Docker. And here's how you do it. So this talks about, okay, they don't have it on Docker Hub, but they, they provide a Docker file inside their Python directory and you can build it. So you can do you can pull down the code and build your own Docker file and then you can run it. They, they give you commands on how to run it. And this is just talking about how to take a uh, take a, an existing tool that doesn't maybe have a Docker file and how to create it. So this is a little more complex than the Docker file I was showing you earlier, but it's really not all that bad. And it's really the same stuff that you would do if you were trying to install a tool manually. So we can start from a, a Python image, which already has Python pre-installed for us. And so, so we don't have to install that. And then we just install the, the dependencies for this particular tool that we're using. And then you know, load in the code for the tool, and we can run it. So that, that's another point that if I want you guys to take out of this. If you, even if you don't want to use Docker, or if you're like, oh, this sounds like too much work, if you're trying to figure out how to install and run a tool that you, you found, and it, it's, it's not working, like you, you, you're in dependency hell, go look at their Docker file. See if there is a Docker file somewhere, because it's, it's literally just step-by-step -step instructions on how to install that tool for you. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, you might search for a blog post and say, hey, how do I install this? And someone goes through like all the trouble they went through, except this is just a, like the commands that you need to run to install it. It might be a little different because your base image might not quite mass match up, but it's definitely a good start. Um, right. I can um, end there, but we can we can keep going after. Ask not for whom the Jason tolls. He tolls yeah. for the. So what we'll do is we're gonna thank everyone for being here. And what we saw was the amount of questions, Ethan. Is I'm going to schedule your four hour Docker workshop for by October. <laughs> Docker is very yeah. I'm not surprised there's a lot of questions because you can yeah. go so many different directions with it. Yep. So I'm going to give you all the Q&A. I'm going to send it to you. You're, you'll be able to use all that to flesh out an entire four hours of, of class. And I'll schedule you for October, if you don't mind. <laughs> if you don't mind, just whip it up. Let's, let's, let's whip discuss it the course. Later, you sure. you know. Yeah, yeah. You, you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. So everyone, thank you so much for being here for today's Black Hills Information Security webcast. What we're going to do is we're going to just, you know, officially round. We're going to officially end and then we're going to do a series of q a so for everyone here thank you so much for being here if you want to if you want to check out feel free if not that's fine if you want to stay that'd be great but if you do need a pen test red team threat hunt or blue team services let us know you know where to find us at blackhillsinformationsecurity.com and with that we're done for today and